Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Unspoken Words. Today, I have Mindy, mom to Olive. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Dr. E. How are you? I am good. How are you today? I'm good. So let's start with, um, tell us a little bit about your story with selective mutism. Sure. So my daughter, Olive, is six now. When she turned two, it was March of 2020. So we all know during that time is right when the pandemic hit. She was set that April, actually, the following month to go into uh, daycare, which would later become her preschool. And of course, that didn't happen. Everything shut down. Uh, It was chaos. And when she was between two and three, she basically stayed home with me. and. I will admit she was pretty understimulated during that time when it came to social exposure and experience. So when she turned three, we were like, all right, we got to get this girl into preschool. So we put her into preschool. And a couple weeks later, we picked her up, my husband and I, and she ran to my husband and said, daddy. And the teacher said, huh, that's the first time I've heard her speak. We thought, oh no, that's not great. What are you talking about? She's not talking. And it was very unusual for us because she was talking at home, no problem, to mom and dad. We had our close little bubble of a few friends and family members. She talks no problem. So why isn't she talking in school? And it kind of came to light in that moment. The teacher said, yeah, she just doesn't seem to be warming up. We thought she would warm up by now. You know, some kids take a little while, but She's really seems nervous. She doesn't really want to play with the other children. She kind of stays by herself. She's not really answering our questions. Sometimes she's frozen throughout the day and we have to kind of help her body transition from one area to the next. And that's when we first realized like some, something's going on. This is either a really hard transition for her or it's going a little bit deeper. So it was at that time that we sought some help. We went to a psychologist before we discovered the Smart Center, and it just didn't seem like a good fit. We weren't really going deep enough into the why behind it all. Why wasn't she speaking? Why did she seem really nervous? And that's when we found the Smart Center and got an evaluation and attended Communicamp. And following that, we really felt like we had some good strategies to implement with her moving forward to help her. And it really answered a lot of questions for us of that. Why, right? Like why is, why is she having trouble in this area? So that was kind of our first, you know, introduction into SM and kind of got the ball rolling in terms of how to, how to best support her. Yeah, no, that's great information. It's interesting. You mentioned COVID. So I just briefly want to say that Children in at this point in the, you know, five, like she's six now. Mm-hmm. So four years ago, you know, when COVID happened, she was two and yeah. she was born during COVID. So for a period, I, I mean, she was like a little baby, mm-hmm. basically. And she had very little interaction, social interaction with adults outside the family community with peers. And so there's a inability to know how to interact. She can't model other kids. She can't work with other kids. She can't play with other kids. She can't learn the innate skills if you're not exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of children in this age range that really struggled. And I mean, think about it when you were out and about, let's say, you know, after the lockdown and you started sneaking out, you had masks and don't go near that person. Don't go near Mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. So these kids were hearing that. So I see a lot. We see a lot of children at the smart center that were affected greatly by COVID. And it's usually the children that were in that preschool age and the middle school age, which were just so affected in kids entering college where you literally had almost like a two year gap. And for a child that's, you know, was two, three, four years old during that time. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, it was basically a third of her life, right? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. At that time. So we can't go the route of, you know, here are stickers to talk and just do it, do it, do it, because they almost don't know how. Exactly. Um, they just don't know how, and it causes them great anxiety. They don't understand the nuances because they didn't witness them and learn them. So that's not surprising to me. And the approach at that point, like you said, is to figure out 
what are her underlying whys, right? But begin mm-hmm. the process to understand what stages of social communication she was at, what was her baseline, and then respect that baseline and begin to move and train you and train teachers. So mm-hmm. you attended Communicamp in July of 2022. What about Olive? Tell us about Olive's experience there. Oh, she loved it. She absolutely loved it. She was excited to go every day to Communicamp. She didn't want it to end. She was sad to go back to her regular camp, oh, geez. <laughs> um, her regular summer camp at preschool. And at the time, you know, she couldn't really articulate why she liked it so much, but we know why she liked it so much. And I think it's because it was very validating. Here were other kids that she was with, peers, that were going through the exact same thing. And they really made it fun. You know, the counselors, there wasn't a focus on speaking, which up until that point was all she ever knew. It was, you know, let's let's see if we can order something off of the little treat cart, you know, that they go around with at Communicamp. Let's talk about the bridge. Let's talk about, you know, our emotion scale, where we are on that scale. And I think that it was rewarding for her to finally have some tools that she felt like she could use even at that young age to help her progress on the bridge. And then certainly for my husband and I, oh my God, like, I think that it was the best decision we ever made attending Communicamp. We felt so lost prior to going to Communicamp. We had no idea what was going on. We had no idea really even what SM was, what does the future look like for her? She just like never going to talk in school. You know, we were scared and coming out of Communicamp, total opposite. We felt confident. We felt like, oh, okay, we have a big understanding now of what's going on. And we have tools in our toolbox that we can implement with our child and strategies that will help her, not might, will. And that was so, so beneficial for us as a family. (laughs) <laughs> One thing that I would say is I look back on Olive's report card from camp. I was curious mm-hmm. myself and she was verbally responsive in initiative day one. Yes, and what does yeah. that mean to me? It means one, she was understood and the clinicians, which are counselors, had the skills and strategies to progress her. So for listeners, when you're thinking about intensive camps, they really can be beneficial for individuals that are starting this process, but also in the midst of treatment because- it really is an intensive process and it's in a school environment. Like we rent a school. So the kids are in a school with clinicians that are counselors with kids that feel like they do. And they're learning these skills. And she progressed into verbal responding, initiating. She was having full you know, conversations day one. And that just means that those strategies worked. And then with that information, you can then go to the school and with either school trainings and you giving that information and learning, you then use that outside of camp. So you can't go to camp, any camp, And expect that camp's going to be the cure-all and end end all and cure-all. But what it is, is the kids see themselves in a really positive light. They learn. Even if some kids, as they get older, some are a little bit more resistant. They don't share a lot with their parents. But sometimes they do. It, It doesn't mean they weren't picking up a lot of information in their understanding. So the bridge... For a five-year-old, a four-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 18-year-old, the bridge is critical because it's a tool. It helps them realize, hey, here's where I'm at and look where I'm at now. And it's okay to bridge down when it gets loud, large, lots of people Mm -hmm. and things like that. And then rating their feelings and understanding. So for Olive, it was a zero to three scale. And so using that and then the specific strategies that we used, and I know Olive did great with you know, all the strategies we were doing in terms of visuals, focusing on the script approach, questionnaires that were at her level Mm -hmm. and at her stage to progress her, she felt safe. And so that's amazing. So I love, 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 love. So tell me about in terms of what the tipping point was for you that you were like, wait, we need treatment. What was that tipping point? So I had been talking with her teachers and they, you know, were really trying, but they were kind of at a loss in what to do. They tried partnering her with some buddies that they thought would kind of mesh with her personality. And they described to me an incident where it seemed like she really wanted to talk to one of her peers 
but instead of the words coming out, her mouth was just opening and closing. And they described this to me as, it seems like she wants to talk. It's just that the words aren't coming out. And I thought, okay, you know, like this is, this is something I think we have to seek help for. And that I would describe that event as the tipping point of like, we need to find somebody who specializes in what at the time I believed was SM and was later confirmed. And that's when I found you guys. And we are so lucky because we're local to the Philadelphia area. And, you know, it's a half hour drive for us to, to go to the smart center. So it was really just serendipity. It worked out. Oh, that that's great. And for families that are far, of course, we do telehealth and parent yeah. coaching and training, but you were right there. So it was like, hey, here you come. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's interesting about that tipping point because there's always a point. I remember with my daughter, Sophie, she was, in a, she was a little bit older. She was going into kindergarten and I'll never forget putting her into a tiny little day camp. But I just want to share because people know me as Dr. E, but, you know, and this is what my life's work's been about. But, you know, I my impetus to this, Mindy, as you know, was my own child Mm -hmm. and her inability to function socially, emotionally, communicatively, academically. She wasn't functioning, right? Preschool. She was shut down, diagnosed with all these other disorders that she didn't have and misunderstood. So that was the fuel. But my tipping point was when I put her in a tiny little camp and it was an arts camp. And I remember going to see her and like you, the teachers really didn't say much to me they just assumed she didn't talk or she was really shy. And so when mm-hmm. I went to see her there, she pulled me into a room and, cl- and made sure the doors were shut. And then she starts whispering to me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, like that, that kind of knowledge and that like, whoa, my, da- my daughter has to pull me into another room. And she looked terrified. And when right. we walked out, she was just a stiff board. I'm like, wait, this is, this something, this is way more than just being shy. Yeah. And I think the key is, you know, as a parent, when you witness something that's really dysfunctional, and causing your child pain, that's a huge tipping point where it's like, why wait? You know, it's not like the things you're learning, the things teachers will be doing, the things your children will be, you know, exposed to are anything but positive social communication experiences. So I think I appreciate you sharing that. And I think a lot of families listening are like, should I get help? Shouldn't I? I'm like, why not Mm -hmm. get help? Because it's going to make a difference in your life. So tell me about Olive now. Tell oh, me about man. what she's doing and yeah. everything, because I know you've yeah. graduated, right? Uh-huh. We've graduated from the Smart Center. She misses it. She misses you guys. But we knew it was time when uh, I could hear her laughing and squealing in the office at the Smart Center from all the way down the hall. And I'm like, how many kids do you guys have where there's a possibility that they're being too loud and possibly distracting someone else in session, right? Um, that's when we kind of knew like, okay, I think we're I think we're okay to dial back on treatment. But anyway, right now she's in kindergarten. I can't believe the year is almost over and she's doing amazing. She has tons of friends. She has absolutely no problems at all communicating verbally with peers and she will even initiate, you know, we'll go to a play space and she doesn't know anybody and she'll go up to a kid and introduce herself, um, which I never, ever thought would happen. Um, with adults, you know, she's still on the shy side. Um, but in school, you know, she's totally communicative with her teacher, responsive and initiative. She she's really thriving. She's she's involved in some extracurriculars. She's she's doing she's doing great. No, it sounds like she's like as I often say to families, it's you look at their level of functioning and she's functioning. And when you mention she's still quote unquote, a bit shy with adults, like she has a timid temperament, right? Yes. Yeah. But that's okay to know. And it's okay for you still to help her in those situations, whether it's through pre-planning, whether it's guessing the common questions, whether it's Mm -hmm. knowing you're going to go into an event of relatively new people, and maybe she'll play some games and interact with them or you know, educate them on how to best interact. That doesn't mean she's not functioning. You just have some tips and strategies to use to maybe help her warm up quicker, right? Arrive early, bring a friend, you know, there's so many things and that's okay because what's happening even at this young age is she's seeing herself in a positive light. And I can tell you just because of treating children through the ages and seeing how they evolve, like years later, reaching out, it's building upon building. So she's set, right? She's good to go. You are knowledgeable. You're good to go. So mm-hmm. she's got the rest of her life to be this, you know, person that we all knew that she was. Yes. And I is- do think, yeah, she, I, I think she's, she's always going to be 
cautious. Like that's just her. That's part of her personality. She still does have a little anxiety. You know, we have a loose tooth right now, her first wiggly tooth. She's nervous about it. She's kind of a nervous kid and that's okay. To your point, we know how to help her now. We know how to help her through that nervousness. And I'm amazed at how quickly she warms up in new situations now. You know, to your point, when we're faced with something new, we know that we need to prepare her ahead of time. And when she walks in the door, she's going to be kind of glued to our hips for the first, I don't know, two to five minutes until we can figure out a way to break the ice and kind of get her get the ball rolling and then she's rolling you know there's she's she's really become way more confident in her ability to separate from us and do her thing so it sounds like the confidence is the fuel to her comfort right she's comfortable mm-hmm. confident which fuels so much and her communication and like you said You know that when you go somewhere, especially louder, larger, lots of people environment, she may need time to warm up. And instead of pushing her away, you know that. Maybe arriving a little bit early, bringing a friend, you know, the SM triangle, that whole philosophy of when someone asks a question, maybe you do need to bring her in by choice occasionally just to get her going. Maybe Mm -hmm. you have to engage somebody else first to take the pressure off. I mean, there's so many benign, easy things that parents and teachers can continue to do for children that are more prone to having a, they are timid, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that you're, and you're also, there's parents that'll often say, well, when this is, when she is cured, she's never going to have anxiety. And that's like, wait, that's not life. Like if you have either a, you know, genetic predisposition to anxiety, you're modeling anxiety. Like we did a podcast with Lynn Lyons about parental anxiety and how that affects our kids and just anxiety in general. And, and, you know, it's not like it's learning the coping skills. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're more prone and educating others on on how to help and dealing with your own anxieties, it's amazing how that does filter over to children because they pick up so much. But you're not trying, you're not, I don't like the word cure, although I believe there's so many that are cured, meaning like they they're cured from their SM. So when someone says you can't be cured from SM, I'm going to tell you that's not true. I have plenty of kids I work with that don't have a ounce of SM. My daughter, who is completely dysfunctional, fully functioning adult, thousands and thousands of kids. So yes, you can be cured for SM. Absolutely. But if you're prone to anxiety, doesn't mean that you're never going to have anxiety in your life. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that there's an awareness there and you need to learn coping skills, possibly through therapy and ongoing therapy for some. Um, But yeah, I think it's unrealistic to say your kid's never going to suffer anxiety. That's like unrealistic. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm certain I'm certainly the parent you were describing that also has anxiety. And so through this journey, like I really had to work on myself, too, in terms of my expectations of what success looked like when we would go out in the world and practice and have these social exposures. And then also, you know, gain perspective around you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Some of our little experiments out in the world were successful and some were not. And just because some weren't successful doesn't mean, oh, we've regressed. Oh, this is, this is going to take forever. You know, she's going to struggle with this forever. No, we got to like challenge that black and white thinking and, you know, gain a little bit of perspective of, in in the long term, what are those little incremental successes that build into where she is today? No, those are great points. And I think that brings up the bridge because for me, where you do train parents when you need to bridge down a little bit. A perfect example for that is when you're out and about, she's giving her order, she's initiating what she needs. She's saying hello to the waiter or waitress. She's completely verbal, but all of a sudden you decide to go out with Aunt Sally, who you haven't seen in three years, Mm -hmm. and she's sitting at a meal and she's quiet and she's not as initiative and she's turning to you. You bridge down a little to bring her into that social communication opportunity. And maybe you bring out a visual and you just, so that's okay. That's, it's not like, it's like you said, I love how you frame that. It's not an all or none thinking, all Mm -hmm. or nothing thinking, right? Black and white. It's understanding the process and understanding that you are going to have to bridge down from time to time. That's life, right? Yes, but it's yes. the understanding of what tools you can take from your toolbox mm-hmm. and use at that point to help your child feel successful 
to be able to at least be on the bridge and communicate and bridge them up ideally in a situation that maybe in the past, if you were like, you need to talk, you need to talk, and they're not, you're just like, well, that was a failed exposure. No, that was an awareness. We went to a new restaurant with a new person and it was really loud. It was large, lots of people. Yeah, she bridged down. That's not a failure. That's an awareness. Yes, yeah. So I really do appreciate you sharing that because I think it helps our listeners, I'm hoping, realize, whoa, that makes sense. This happened to me last week when we were at the soccer mm-hmm. field. I, I don't want to get up. And then some parents project that anxiety that they have of why they weren't verbal in that moment because they don't have the awareness. So I think right. parental education, would you say, was really key for you, correct? A hundred percent. And I remember we had a couple of just like parent only sessions with her therapist at the smart center for that very reason. And I remember there was one, we were a couple months into our treatment at that time and we went to a birthday party and we had gotten pretty good at birthday parties by that point. And by good, I mean, you know, she would play with the other children, interact with them. We could bridge and she would you know, come into verbalization. And there was this one birthday party. It was a disaster. She didn't talk at all. She just did not leave my side. And I remember feeling so discouraged and talking to her therapist and saying like, what's going on? You know? And her therapist said, okay, well, let's start from the beginning. What was the morning like before you went to the birthday party? And I said, oh, it was a mess. We were rushing around. She had a tantrum because something didn't go right. And she's a little perfectionist. And so she had a meltdown. We arrived late to the party. There were a million people there. It was so hot. They tried to shove like 50 people into this Philadelphia row home. I was so uncomfortable, you know, and she's like, okay, we need to look, listen, learn, right? You're telling me you arrived late. It was crowded. It was probably loud, loud, large, lots of people. It was hot. Even you were uncomfortable. You wanted to leave. How do you think Olive felt? And I'm like, oh, yeah. We didn't set her up for success, did we? (laughs) She's like, no. Like, it's no wonder that that was a really hard experience. And those are the types of things, like, again, instead of just leaving that experience and saying, well, that was a total failure being able to kind of pick it apart and, you know, know what we can do better for next time. And the next birthday party, it was successful because we did kind of get in front of some of those things. So I think it's, it's important, you know, again, to realize this isn't a linear process. There's going to be ups and downs. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that experience. Cause that's, that's great to hear that you know, that's exactly what you did because you kind of back it up to, you know, different things that that may have occurred that created that increased anxiety and lack of social communication, mm-hmm. comfort and confidence and their ability to function in that environment. And you just back it up and then you try to, you know, accommodate that the next time. And that's exactly what you did. So it's almost like a checkoff, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you learn about it rather than, oh, this was a failed opportunity And I do appreciate even when it wasn't the best kind of opportunity for her, or you know, it was an experience that was positive, so to speak, it wasn't negative in the sense that you learned. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going at Olive and say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you talk? Why didn't you separate? Which really shames a lot of children. I have to educate parents a lot, Mindy, on be careful what you say. You should, you need to, why didn't you? All of that creates a little, like create shame in our children because Mm -hmm. if they could, they would. Yep. And so look, listen, and learn is such an important concept because our kids tell us everything by what they're even not saying, how they're acting, what's their body language. And Olive is a very sensitive child. So being a sensitive child, those sensory experiences are going to affect her. And yes. it's an awareness at that moment, maybe not in the midst of that row, small, like you said, overcrowded row home in Philly, I know what they look like. I'm from Philly, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, you know, you arrived real early. You were more on the outskirts. You went in the kitchen more. Like maybe you brought a friend. So that was the focus. I mean, there's just lots of things that, that you, I'm sure that you did different. So thank you for sharing that. So what are, what is your advice to parents that are struggling now and not sure what to do and just really at a loss? So I think that trying a variety of strategies is a great starting point to figure out what works 
for your child and what is less successful. So, you know, the verbal intermediary for us, that was never so successful. She did it sometimes. Sometimes it would help her in the school setting. Mostly she used it, you know, once she developed a friendship with a couple of peers, she used it as a way to get her needs met. So if she needed more milk, she would go to her peer next to her and say, hey, could you ask the teacher for more milk? Could you tell them that I need more milk? And they would raise their hand and, you know, ask the teacher for for something else to drink. But it was never really like something that she grasped onto. What did work for us was the visuals. So, you know, this would be the script writing for older kids. For her, because she wasn't a reader yet, I would just create, you know, drawings. And we would go out to a restaurant or we would go out to a store. I know you always say same one or two restaurants, same one or two stores. So our store was Target. And I would create a list of, you know, three things. I wouldn't give her the whole grocery list. I would just say, here are the three things that we need. And one of those things was always something for her. So she was, you know, motivated, right? So I would say, okay, we need mouthwash, we need tissues, and then we're going to get you a toy. And I'm going around the store. I'm like, I just cannot find mouthwash, right? So I said, Olive, we got to find somebody to help us find this thing. And then we're going to get to the toys. So the faster we can find this, the faster we're going to get to the toys. So I would find an employee. I would say, excuse me, could you help us with something? Olive, what is it that we were looking for? And sometimes, you know, especially in the beginning, she wouldn't say anything. Deer in headlights. So I would bridge down. It was the second thing on the list. What was that thing? Still nothing. Was it mouthwash or was it hand soap? Or was it hand soap or mouthwash? And she would say mouthwash really, really quietly, right? But the benefit that we had with the visuals is the store employee sees a giant visual of mouthwash on the piece of paper. So even if they didn't hear her, I would say, did you get that? And they would say mouthwash, sure. And I think that started giving her confidence because I think she felt like, oh man, that worked. Like they they heard me, you know, they probably didn't hear her. They were looking at the list, but she didn't know that. So they would help us find mouthwash and then we would get to the toy. Also at Target, we would always get a cake pop at Starbucks. And I had a little visual of a cake pop so that she could place her order. And it was the same situation. Even if she said it very quietly, they could see the visual. They knew she wanted a pink cake pop. And it was repetition, repetition, repetition. We did that once a week, every week for probably a year. And it was the same thing with the restaurant. We are so lucky. We live in the city. We're right across the street from a restaurant. And it was summertime when we first were engaged with the Smart Center. They have a great patio space. And she loved this place. Best burger in town for her. And they had toys for the kids, like action figures, and sidewalk chalk. So we could sit on their little patio area with sidewalk chalk and toys and burger and fries. I mean, that's a great evening for a kid. So that was, you know, an incentive for her as well. She liked that place. So I would go and I would have my visual menu of what she could order. And again, it started slow at first. She would just point to the visuals and I would say, okay, what is this that you're pointing to? Cheeseburger. What is this that you're pointing to? French fries. And we went there all the time, all the time, all the time to the point where we don't need the visuals anymore. She's just telling the server, this is, this is her order. And, you know, we were also regulars that helped. We knew all the staff. So she was building comfort, you know, with these familiar faces. Um, And it was the same deal with the toys, you know, I want to play with the toys. And I'd say, okay, let's ask our server, Julie. So we would go over to Julie. I would say, Julie, Olive has a question. What was your question? Nothing. Did you want to play with the toys, the sidewalk chalk, or both? Both. And Julie would say, oh, of course, I can get those for you. And she would bring them out for Olive. So anyway, in terms of advice, your original question, I think it's finding what works for your child, making sure that they're interested and invested in the places that you're going to practice. And then repetition. Just, you got to just kind of beat them over the head with it. Like, because what happens is the more you do it, of course, the less scary it is. And we got to a point with Olive that she's, she's bored with it. It's like, oh my God, mom, I'll go out to Target. I still do it with her. I'll say, excuse me, can you help us find something? Olive, what was it that we needed? She's like, batteries. (laughs) 
<laughs> the employee's like, oh, sure, batteries. Here's here's where they are. She's like, come on, mom. Like, you, you don't know where this stuff is by now. Like, we've done this a million times. So I think that repetition aspect is so important. And to really be like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, tenacious, you yeah. know, with practicing. No, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, some children when they're four or five can use the bridge as a game. So they give my order, give my order game, the store game, whatever you want to call it and showing them where they are on the bridge. And some kids need external motivation. So they get more stickers for this or more stickers for that. And the use of the verbal intermediary for me, just to clarify, is when a teacher asks a question, for example, do you want the red or the blue? They focus on another child first because that decreases expectations. Do you want the red or the blue? It turns to Olive. What color do you want? Do you want the red or the blue or the green? And she doesn't answer. It's like red, blue, or green, tell Rebecca. So you, mm-hmm. the teacher prompts the use. I'm not a big advocate of just go up to your friend, tell them something, then your friend gets up across the room and tells the teacher. The, the point for me of a verbal intermediary is the child is using their words in relation to that person's question, which is the SM triangle. And Mm -hmm. I'll put that as a resource in the podcast, but the SM triangle link, the person asking questions with the person they're comfortable with. So, but you were doing that successfully in stores and restaurants. You were that intermediary. So you gave her the opportunity, stage three. You even said, what are we looking for? Open-ended thought provoking question, but you had the visual Mm -hmm. because remember the visual you see, the choices you hear that minimizes their need to think and process. And every time you repeat it, it's just it helps them ingrain that more. So it gets a quicker response, less of a warm up, less of a response time. And so when she didn't answer to what do we want, you went down to a bridge with the right, I'm sorry, to a choice with the right answer second. So that was the last thing she heard. So that let her hear the answer without, you know, it's kind of like a cheat sheet, seeing the visual and hearing the choice is a cheat sheet. So what I love about that is that you were doing that and you as a parent, we're using those strategies to progress her. So she heard herself. She saw herself. She realized she could do it. And you didn't necessarily use the bridge to show her, but it worked for her. And that's okay. Like whatever you were doing with all these things, it was amazingly strategic on your end. Mm-hmm. And that's the same things that teachers need to do. They need to have specific skills that they use with that child in the classroom. Not what they did with another child with SM necessarily. I'm sure there's some overlap, but for a child like Olive, And her presentation, that teacher, and I'm sure that's what happened, the tools you gave them, had school, you know, trainings, you know, they had to do it too, because you cannot rely on a child that goes to Communicamp or any of the intensive programs or an individual intensive or treatment just to be like, okay, mom and dad step back, teachers step back, and the child's going to go into that environment and be able to do it all the time. It's about training you as parents, training teachers, educating others on what can you do to facilitate those strategies to bring success to your child. And that's exactly, Mindy, you did it. You know, every now and then you get a family that comes to session and they're like, we didn't get to do anything the last month. We didn't leave. And and so what I'm thinking is, wait, we need to step back. There had to be some opportunity unless you were locked in your home. And even then you could have had people over, right? Mm -hmm. You have to do the work. Yes, you have yeah. to do it. The only way a child is going to overcome this, the only way a child is going to build the skills is through exposure, exposure, and more exposure. And that's what you did. And all of the real world things that you're sharing with me, what that does is it stimulates the social communication pathways. She's interacting with people she doesn't know. She's using her words towards adults, new people, new experiences. That carries over into school. Yes, so for yeah. parents that are like, we just need help with school. Well, that's not realistic. You need mm-hmm. help in all aspects of your life. Unless you're a speech phobic, which wouldn't be a child your child's age, and they're eight years old, 10 years old, and they're stuck only in school, that's different. That's a whole different strategy, bag of tricks. But in your case, and in a very typical, more SM, five-year-old, six-year-old, four-year-old, you know, you did it. And that's why your child overcame this quickly. And this is why your child's thriving. And you still have those skills. You're still pulling them out. I just used them the other day. We were at Chick-fil-A. And for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe she didn't like the look of the cashier. I don't know. He he was like a tall, burly guy. So maybe she was a little oh. intimidated. You know, I had to say, do you want chicken strips or chicken nuggets? You know, I and and that's okay. That's like totally I said, we have, we have the tools. And then the, the school part of it was also huge. You know, we really had to build a trusting relationship with the staff at preschool. 
And we had lots of calls where I could pass along some of the strategies that we learned from the Smart Center, things that they could try out, and also a call with Jen Brittingham to provide them some additional education. And we were lucky that they were very receptive. And, you know, there were some accommodations that they couldn't, they couldn't really help us with just because of the rules of the facility. And also it was still COVID time. So it was, they were really strict about, you know, parents coming into the facility, that sort of thing. But where they could help, they would. And that's another big reason why she made progress because they were like, they were on board in helping us. And some of the strategies were like wild. I think I mentioned at a parent panel, she was frozen for a while at school When she first walked in, all the kids are expected to go to the sink and wash their hands. That's the first thing they're expected to do after they put their like backpacks in their cubby. And she was just frozen. She just could not get to the sink to wash her hands. She would just stand in front of her cubby. And I don't mean to laugh, but it's kind of a a funny visual looking back on it now. At the time, it was very stressful. Um, So, you know, we were talking with the teachers, like, how can we help her with this hand washing thing? And I said, what obviously this is a uh, area of stress. I think it has something to do with the fact that you're kind of bombarding her with a demand when she first walks in the door. And what we know, look, listen, and learn is that she needs time to warm up. So for a little while, can we just give her a little squirt of Purell, you know, um, and see how we do with that. And then once she has a little bit of a break with just Purell, which I think will be, you know, feasible for her at this moment, maybe we can revisit the hand washing. So that's what we did at first. So then she's doing well with, you know, kind of a decrease of warm up time. She gets her Purell, she goes and sits down at her spot and has her breakfast. So I thought, let's try the hand washing again. So they say, hey, today, Olive, we're going to be washing hands. We're all out of Purell. And she goes to the sink and she's frozen again. So I'm thinking, what can we do? We need to find a way to like take the pressure off of her because for some reason she feels like there's pressure behind this request. She feels like she's in the spotlight. So I sent her into school with a rubber ball and Mm -hmm. I made up a whole story. This rubber ball is really naughty because it gets dirty every night when you're not looking. And so I want you to take this into school. You need to give this ball a good wash because (laughs) it was really naughty overnight. Wash the ball and then put it back in your cubby. And she started calling it her cheeky ball because we were watching a lot of Bluey and um, they say cheeky all the time. So that worked. She went to the sink. She washed her ball, thereby washing her hands, put it in her cubby. No problem. And so it was an inanimate object that she could put the attention towards. The attention was now on the inanimate object. It wasn't on her. Yes. And then we were able to kind of you know, get away from the ball. So we started using the ball only in the mornings, not after going to the bathroom, for instance. And then a couple mornings, oh, Olive, I'm so sorry. I forgot to pack your cheeky ball. I didn't forget. I intentionally didn't pack it until eventually we phased out the ball and she was able to wash her hands. So anyway, why, like, you know, things that, you know, you would never think could help. Like we're trying to think outside the box and we're trying, and we're working with our teachers like, Hey, is this okay to try? They're like, yeah, we'll try it. It was that type of stuff that we really had to get creative with. Yeah, no. And I think this podcast is going to be wonderful for parents because what they're going to hear from you is listen to the creativity this mom did. And I can do that too. Mm-hmm. And she didn't get defeated. She just was like, okay, two steps back once, you know, three steps forward and look at you. So you are truly an inspiration. And this is why, you know, it's just so wonderful that you're on here sharing your experience because the goal is to give families hope. The goal is that kids don't need to stay selectively mute. They don't need to stay shut, stay shut down. You know, the one thing we didn't touch on is friendships. So tell me if you could share with me, what did you do to help her build her social connections? Yeah, yeah, especially coming out of the pandemic. And I got to be honest, I was nervous because that meant in order to have her build friendships with peers, I had to build relationships with parents. I'm like, oh, God, I don't, you know, I don't want to have to make friends, you know? <laughs> and so I kind of had to challenge my own social anxiety to mingle and to get phone numbers and to arrange play dates. And I did. I asked her teachers who are the kids that she gravitates the most towards? That was my first step. 
can you pass along their parents' contact information? And then I would reach out and I would organize play dates. So we started just with one buddy at a time coming over to our house. I would always organize an activity. That's something that you guys recommend is, again, take the focus off of talking, put it onto an activity. So I would buy crafts and have them set up. They would each have the same exact materials. They would be working across from each other at the dining room table. And before you know it, the crafting turned into giggling and the giggling turned into, do you want to see my room? And then they would be off playing. And we kind of built upon that with, okay, now we'll have two friends over from class. Okay, now we have a birthday party for Tegan and a bunch of your friends are going to be there, you know? And so we really tried to take advantage of any social opportunity with her peers outside of the classroom so that when she was in the classroom, she had that experience and it would translate over into school in terms of verbalization. So That was really helpful. And another thing we did was put her into extracurriculars. So we tried dance class, we did gymnastics, we did an art class. So again, outside of the school environment, continuing to have these social experiences. And it was a little bit of trial and error. You know, she wasn't really a fan of the dance class for whatever reason. She just wasn't comfortable there. I don't know if it was the teacher you know, it was also a situation where parents were expected to wait outside of the dance studio and she was in there, you know, on her own. That wasn't as successful. Gymnastics, on the other hand, wildly successful. She loved the gymnastics coach. She, you know, was, it was really helpful because one of her primary, you know, symptoms of SM was the physicality of, of, it all, you know, that she would physically get frozen in addition to not being able to get her words out. And the gymnastics, just being able to move her body, that was a great thing for her to to practice, you know, in the setting of peers and a different adult teacher figure. And it was kind of a similar situation as the, the ball story. She was definitely slow with all of the things that were asked of her at gymnastics, but she got there. The only thing that she wouldn't do was jump on the trampoline. It was very bizarre to me because I would think that's like the more the most fun part. I don't know what what's going on with the trampoline. And she wouldn't really tell me. She didn't know why she was afraid to jump on the trampoline. So it was the same situation. I told the gymnastics coach, can we make something bounce on the trampoline? Instead of olive jumping, olive do these jumps, it's olive. Make this sponge bounce. They had one of these like giant sponges, like that you wash a car with. Can we make this sponge go up and down? And she would like slowly bend her knees to make the sponge go up and down. And before you knew it, the sponge was flying all over the place and she was laughing and it was all very silly. So anyway, it was um, not just school, not just same restaurants and, and same stores, but also what are some even, you know, different environments where she can be around peers and practice some of these uh, strategies. So that was that was extremely helpful as well. Yeah, no, a really great um, strategy is when you take your friends out to get something to eat. They're so oh, distracted sure, with yeah. their friends, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they're giving their order without even any prompts because they're with their friend and they're having so much fun. So there's so many things you can do with peers to create these social communication opportunities outside of a typical play date that maybe you know parents are creating these opportunities through baking and through art and you know, you were able to, you know, like you said, you did it, you built it up a little bit at a time. And then all of a sudden, you expand to more peers and the confidence they get from working with those peers and building that will expand over to others. So voila, here's Olive now, a a fully functioning, verbal, confident little girl that's got the rest of her life to, to live and, and shine and grow. And honestly, you're, you're a real inspiration. So I, I thank you so much for this because for me, it's so rewarding to know that, you know, your life was so positively affected and your child is thriving. That's what this is about. So thank you. Thank you. Any last minute comments to, to our listeners? You know, I think it's, it's, there were times throughout the process where I felt like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Is this ever going to happen for us? You know? And I look back on 
those moments now. Hindsight is twenty twenty, And I think, you know, yeah, it is, it is absolutely possible. Try not to get defeated in those instances where it doesn't go the way you'd hoped, you know, that birthday party that I described, if nothing else, that was still an experience for Olive that she came out of okay. You know, that was stressful for her, but she left that experience, hopefully somewhere deep down with the knowledge of that was a really hard birthday party, but I made it, I made it through, you know? And so even the negative experiences are positive. You know, she, gymnastics, for instance, she had a substitute coach one one lesson and she cried and she was frozen. And after that, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, it's only, it's only if we have this one coach that she does well, she's not going to be able to do well with anybody else. But that experience was, hey, Olive, sometimes you're going to have a substitute. You know, that's that's an experience that she gained. And guess what? The next time it was a substitute in gymnastics or at school, she handled it better because she knew that that's something that can happen, you know? So in any case, I think it's just, you know, plan the work, work the plan. Sometimes <laughs> it's going to go well, sometimes it's not, but keep at it because it's worth it and you definitely can make progress. Yeah, this is great. Great. Please tell Olive, we're so proud of her and we're excited for her. And we'd love you to, since you're in Philly, to come to the panel and bring Olive and she can work in the little kids room. You know, oh my she'll gosh, feel she would so love confident. that. Yeah. So we love when our community campers that went through the process come back and they come back as like big shots, so to speak. And it's an inspiration for the kids there. Because here's Olive, who was at Communicamp. Camp, look at her now, mm -hmm. and she can play, she can draw with them, she can maybe read a book to them. Like, mm -hmm. what an incredible confidence booster for Olive, but how inspirational is that for the kids there that are looking at her going, wow, if she can do this, mm -hmm. I bet I can do this. So we do welcome you. And if you're definitely interested, reach out to Lisa Marie because- yeah. Uh, yeah, because we'd love to have you. And, you know, she can just come for a couple hours. It, it just would be great. Yeah. Every yeah. summer, she still <laughs> talks about it. She, she still says, can we go to community camp this summer? And it's kind of like, well, honey, you don't really need it, you know, but she yeah. has so much fun. She just thinks of it as like a fun experience that she wants yeah, to do yeah, again. Yeah. But yeah, little, little junior counselor. That would be so cute. We would love to have her. She'll get a t-shirt. She'll be in the room and oh, she'll wow. be what a big shot I am, you know, uh -huh. and again, it works in every way, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was great. Awesome. Mindy, have a great day. Great. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.